We're going to take a centripetal approach in analyzing our cross-sectional images. We're going to look at each layer in turn, starting with the scalp, then looking at the calvarium, the potential epidural and subdural spaces, mention briefly the subarachnoid space, and then finish talking about the parenchyma and ventricular hemorrhage. Before we can talk about the localization of lesions, we have to have a brief review of the anatomy, and it's also very good to have a logical approach in looking at the image and have kind of a checklist. You look first for obvious lesions, mass effect, or herniation. Examine the symmetry of the sulci, the cisterns, and the ventricular system for signs of mass effect and herniation. Can you see the gray-white matter demarcation, which may be lost if the patient is having vasospasm or an ischemic event? And then we can look for signal or attenuation abnormalities. These little crude cartoons illustrate the different layers, with the white being the scalp and the skull, the green line being the dura and the arachnoid membrane, which are normally in contact with each other, the purple color being the pia, the pink being the brain, and of course the blue is a schematic of the ventricular system. And again, looks very much like a normal sagittal T1 weighted MR image. We also want to review the coronal anatomy, and again, we want to remember these different layers in turn and how a hematoma may be trapped uh, in between any of these layers. In analyzing grossly for herniation and shift, we look at the sulci and we look at the cisternal spaces. The two most important cisterns are the supracellar cistern, which is classically described as a five or a six-pointed star. We look for the amputation of the points of the star or gross deformity of the brain or herniation of the brain into that cisternal space. We can also judge from the position of the fourth ventricle if there is mass effect in the posterior fossa. We must also look at our cross-sectional images to understand the relationship of the supracellar cistern with the brain stem, the interpeduncular cistern, and the uh, circle of Willis vessels and the cranial nerves passing through that region. We also consider that everyone deserves a smile. The smile is not from me or from you, but the smile is the cistern behind the upper portion of the brain stem, the quadrigeminal plate, and this is another area to look for midline shift or herniation. If you don't see visible cerebrospinal fluid either in the quadrigeminal plate cistern or in the supracellar cistern, respectively behind and in front of the brain stem, this may be because the patient has brain swelling or has central herniation without any lateralization or midline shift. So we look again for the quadrigeminal plate cistern behind the upper portion of the brain stem at the level of the midbrain or mesencephalon. So let's think about where blood may be localized in the context of traumatic hemorrhage. And if we go from outside to in, we'll begin by looking at the scalp. We can see here in this patient that there is elevation of the scalp fat off of the skull. We may not wish to accept this, but we are, to one degree or another, all fat heads. And the scalp fat will be elevated off of the bone when there is a collection of blood in that potential subgaleal space. Subgaleal hematomas by themselves are typically of little consequence, but we must remember that in children we can have a hemodynamically significant blood loss into this space. It is a sign or an indicator of a contact injury to the skull, and there's a potential for an epidural hematoma to decompress itself through the skull fracture into that epidural space. Gross picture here showing the scalp being reflected backwards, and underneath the scalp we can see the large uh, subgaleal hematoma. Look very briefly at the skull. Skull fractures in the past have been classified as being linear, stellate, depressed, basilar, or eggshell fractures. Eggshell fractures are usually not seen in living patients, and as you might imagine, this is similar to the appearance of a hard-boiled egg that has been smashed with the bone fragments held together by the membranes or the skull fragments held together by the membranes. When we look at a skull fracture, we typically expect to see lucencies. However, if we see an area of increased attenuation in a skull fracture, that can only be produced by overriding of bone fragments, and that indicates that the patient has a depressed skull fracture. Readily shown here on the frontal view of the skull and on the cross-sectional image, we can see that there is a piece of depressed bone. And yet the hemorrhage into the scalp itself and the scalp swelling obscures the depression of the bone. 
During the healing phase, a depression might be visualized in this patient as the swelling begins to dissipate. And again, we can see in a gross picture from a different patient where the skull has been displaced inwardly and has contacted the underlying brain. Let's now talk about the membrane hematomas. The most significant one that we've all learned about is the epidural hematoma. The epidural hematoma is blood trapped between the periosteal layer of the dura and the naked inner table of the skull. Hemorrhages in this location are typically going to be biconvex or lens-shaped and are usually significantly limited or delimited by the attachment of the periosteum at the calvarial sutures indicated here by the green arrows. So let's talk about these uh, secondary lesions and the epidural hematoma and remind ourselves that these patients may be in the category of talk and die. And some of you may remember uh, many famous people have had a problem like this. Natasha Richardson in 2009 had relatively minor trauma, seemed to be okay, and yet she died from herniation caused by an epidural hematoma. Now, in discussing this with my mother, who is a retired pathologist, I tried to explain to her that my understanding of these membrane hematomas might be a little bit different. A cephalohematoma is a subperiosteal hematoma for the outer table of the skull. An epidural hematoma is also a subperiosteal hematoma, but one that is related to the inner table of the skull. And a subdural hematoma is actually located in the space between the dura and the arachnoid. It is over the arachnoid, so it is an epiarachnoid hematoma. And of course, when I told this to my mother, my mother said, Jean, you are a little twisted. And I think she is right about that. But let's think about the epidural hematoma. And again, the epidural hematoma is accumulating between the naked skull and the next layer in, which is the dura, and the dura is composed of two different membranes, one of which is the definitive periosteum for the inner table of the skull. This is a two-year-old with a dilated pupil. The reason why the patient has the cranial nerve deficit is because this expanding epidural hematoma is causing subfalsial herniation and downward transtentorial herniation, which is pressing on the third nerve as it passes through the subarachnoid space of the supracellar cistern, one of the checkpoints that we mentioned earlier in our discussion. And again, the gross picture, which is from a different patient, illustrates how we get this biconvex or lens-shaped impression on the surface of the brain. We may also appreciate the sulci are very narrow, ipsilateral to the hematoma, and yet they're very, very deep on the opposite side. If we look at a newborn skull, we can clearly see how the skull is formed of individual bony plates, and an individual membrane surrounds each one of those bony plates, and it is within that membrane that we have the loculation of the epidural hematoma. But the sequela the patient experiences is not from the hematoma itself, it's from the secondary expansion of the hematoma that causes the brain to be displaced and to butt up against the dural barriers of the fox in the midline and the tentorium running roughly horizontally between the supertentorial and the infratentorial or posterior fossa space, causing herniation of the cingular gyrus and herniation of the uncus into the circumesencephalic cistern that is in between the quadrigeminal cistern and the supracellar cistern and compressing on the nerves that pass through that space. Most importantly, we judge that compression by seeing that the pupil is dilated from pressure against the third nerve, but the fourth nerve or the trochlear nerve is also going to be compressed by the same mass effect. Clinically, epidural hematomas most commonly affect young men, but this is because young men do stupid things that expose themselves to situations where they may suffer from head trauma. But it's typically young people because as we get older, and typically over the age of 40, the periosteal layer of the dura becomes more adherent to the inner table of the skull and resists being dissected off to create the space for the epidural hematoma. Epidural hematomas are usually associated with a skull fracture, which can oftentimes be seen on the CT, but may be more easily visualized on a plain skull radiograph. The primary source of bleeding is typically from the meningeal arteries, but theoretically may come from other sources, including the dural sinuses and from the diploic veins. Classically, patients with epidural hematoma have been described as having a lucid interval, 
During this lucid interval, they may be imbued with cosmic knowledge of the universe. This may be a time for them when Steely Dan lyrics seem to make some kind of sense. And in discussing the actual incidence and rate at which patients have the lucid interval, it is actually very, very complex. And Dr. Paul Cooper has described a variety of different uh, patterns of being unconscious, being lucid, and being unconscious again. And we must realize that this is only a very theoretical clinical construct that the patient has this lucid interval. Some patients never have the lucid interval. Some patients never have any unconsciousness to create the bracket to produce the lucid interval. But what actually happens to produce an epidural hematoma? We have displacement of the skull bones, creating a fracture between the bones that may also produce a transient reversible loss of consciousness. At the time the fracture is created, the periosteum is stripped away from the bone. There is a laceration of the meningeal arteries. The magic is that the inner or meningeal layer of the dura, which is a little bit more elastic and more robust, remains intact. And the meningeal arteries are in between these two different layers of the dura, the meningeal and the periosteal layer. The blood then begins to accumulate in the space between the naked bone and the periosteal layer of the dura. And we must remember that it takes normal arterial pressure to continue to dissect the periosteum from the bone. Someone who is hypotensive, someone who is in shock, may not have sufficient arterial pressure to allow the periosteum to be dissected off of the bone. If we look at a transilluminated skull, we can see the normal landmarks of the greater wing of the sphenoid, the orbital roof, and the petrous bone, and we can see the lucencies created by the pulsation of the branches of the middle meningeal artery. And when the fracture line crosses these grooves, it may lacerate the arteries. And so in this resected skull specimen, we can see the lucency or the groove made by the meningeal artery, and we can see how the fracture crosses that vessel. This patient obviously didn't do well, and we can see by lifting the scalp away and then lifting the dura away that there is a hematoma on top of the dura, and this time the gross brain picture is from the same patient, again illustrating the impression, the biconvex or lens-shaped impression of the epidural hematoma. Epidural hematoma under the frontal bone, again demarcated by the coronal suture. Epidural hematoma under the occipital bone demarcated by the lambdoidal suture, again both convex. Here's a patient that has a subfrontal epidural hematoma. We must remember that there should be a fracture, and if we look, this patient does not have displacement of the pineal gland, but using bone windowing, the fracture is readily evident in the frontal bone overlying the area where we have the accumulating epidural hematoma. The treatment of epidural hematoma involves a craniotomy, draining the blood clot, and identifying the artery that is the source of the bleeding. If the artery is not repaired, there is no reason to think that the epidural hematoma would not reaccumulate. Not every epidural hematoma requires emergent uh, surgical evacuation. In this case illustrated here, we have small epidural hematomas. How small is small? This epidural hematoma is not causing significant midline shift or herniation. We can identify that because we can still see the smile of the quadrigeminal plate cistern. And again, as we've talked about before, if we see the CSF behind the brainstem in the QP cistern and anterior to the brainstem in the supracellar cistern, we may not have a situation that requires emergent neurosurgical therapy. As we've talked about before, doing an imaging study is taking a snapshot in time and the disease process may change. At 10 o'clock in the morning, this child was neurologically intact, but 10 hours later at 8 p.m., the patient had an expanding epidural hematoma, which is now causing some slight midline shift and a little bit of herniation. So things can change over time. Let's now talk about blood accumulating in the theoretical potential subdural space. And again, a subdural hematoma can also be called by the nickname of an epiarachnoid hematoma. And this is very useful in understanding how a subdural hematoma may spread into the interhemispheric fissure and also around the convexity and under the temporal lobe and under the occipital lobe. Isolated subdural hematomas are most often limited 
to very, very young patients and infants and to the elderly. And the isolated subdural hematoma may be associated with a subacute or chronic clinical presentation with a very minimal neurologic deficit. Complicated subdural hematomas in association with other lesions are what we usually see as the result of motor vehicle crashes in middle-aged patients, and the acute clinical presentation may be the result of the other associated injuries rather than from the blood accumulating in the subdural space. The subdural hematoma is under the dura. It must therefore also be over the arachnoid. If we want it to be histologically the most accurate, the subdural hematoma is actually in between the dural border cells and the arachnoid barrier layer of the dura. And on a practical level, no one uses this terminology, but it has been in the literature since 1978. Going back to our schematic cartoon, where the white is the skull and the green is the dura, and the red color is the uh, arachnoid membrane, the subdural hematoma is usually concave around the cerebral hemisphere and typically spreads around the hemisphere without any limitation by the calvarial sutures. And if we look here at this subacute presentation on MR in the sagittal and the coronal plane, we can see how this extra axial lesion of high signal intensity is spreading around the convexity of the cerebral hemisphere with a very significant anterior to posterior extension. If we look at axial images with a nice drawing on the right hand side, we can see that the uh, subdural hematoma is layered around almost the entire cerebral hemisphere. Despite the significant mass effect and herniation, there is relatively little displacement of the pineal gland, which is why we don't use plain films as the only evaluation for intracranial herniation and shift. And again, there is also effacement of the ipsilateral sulci, which are much larger on the unaffected hemisphere. The subfalsial herniation, the secondary effect, which may progress over time, is what typically causes the most harm for these patients. We can also see that the subarachnoid space continues to be filled with cerebrospinal fluid, once again proving that the subdural space is on top of the arachnoid. It truly is the epiarachnoid space. If we look at these two images and we remember how we approach the brain in cross-section as a clock face, we don't see any of the normal markings between 12 o'clock and 4 o'clock on the side that has the hematoma. We can see that there is compression of the ipsilateral lateral ventricle, but we also recognize in this case that the extra axial subdural collection is nearly iso in attenuation to the underlying gray matter of the brain. And this is one of those unusual conditions where we have an isodense or iso attenuating subdural hematoma. But it is the secondary effect of the compression of the ventricles and the subfalsial herniation that are most detrimental to the patient's survival. So subdural hematomas uh, are going to occur in isolation at the extremes of age where they may be able to have a delayed presentation. There is no strong association between fractures and subdural hematomas. And as we've seen, they can be crescentic because of delayed presentation. They may not be hyper attenuating at presentation. And they can accumulate in the interhemispheric fissure in children. And this space is truly the epiarachnoid space. The most common source of bleeding is described in the literature as being due to tearing of the bridging veins. And we'll see in an illustration in just a second exactly how that happens. The tearing of the bridging veins can be produced without having a contusion, can be produced without having a penetrating injury, can be due solely to acceleration or deceleration forces. So we can have acceleration, deceleration. Most commonly in the sagittal plane, this is going to cause a subdural hematoma. The bridging veins can stretch and tear, and then the blood begins to dissect the arachnoid off of the dura, accumulating in that subdural uh, epiarachnoid space. Just as a reminder, the bridging veins connect the cerebral cortex to the large dural sinus, the superior sagittal sinus. Looking at this 3D reconstruction, we can see these very, very large bridging veins that have a perpendicular orientation at their insertion into the superior sagittal sinus. 
we must remember that the brain is floating in the cerebrospinal fluid and your brain may weigh 1100 grams but inside of your skull it only has an effective weight of about 50 grams and the bridging veins connect the cerebral hemisphere to the superior sagittal sinus. Because the brain is floating, the brain movement may lag behind the movement of the skull. So if we move the skull very rapidly with an acceleration or a deceleration, the movement of the brain lags behind. And as the brain lags behind, those bridging veins become stretched. And the bridging veins are most likely to tear at the point where they insert into the superior sagittal sinus. And typically it's not one vein, but multiple veins that tear, and it may be veins on both sides of the midline, so the patient may have bilateral subdural hematomas. This is very different from the epidural hematoma, where we usually have only one fracture, only on one side, and only one intracranial epidural hematoma. And again, the blood typically begins to accumulate near the skull vertex where the veins insert on the superior sagittal sinus and tends to layer around the convexity of the cerebral hemisphere. In cross-section, we can see this extra-axial high attenuation collection. Notice the asymmetry of the sulci, which are barely visible under the hematoma and much larger on the unaffected uh, opposite side. And if we look farther down, we can see that there is more blood in that extraaxial subdural space. It is causing significant distortion of our two landmark cisterns, the supracellar cistern and the quadrigeminal plate cistern. There is gross distortion of the brain stem, and there is uh, transtentorial downward herniation, and this patient would be expected to have a cranial nerve deficit as a result of that herniation. Marked here in the purple color is the opening in the tentorium, the tentorial hiatus. Again, here at a different level, large extraaxial hematoma, significant asymmetry of the ventricles from subfalsial herniation. And again, the brain is going to be held back by the relatively rigid uh, margins of the fox. What does it look like pathologically? We can see here that the dural membrane is intact. We can see those meningeal vessels between the two layers of the dura. Reflect that membrane back and look underneath the dura and we should see the subdural hematoma. So the membrane has now been reflected back and we have this large current jelly subdural hematoma. Again, schematically illustrated in the upper right hand corner. Another autopsy photograph illustrating on the patient's left side, looking down from the top, a very, very large area of discoloration uh, underneath the dural membrane. And if we look here at this coronal section, we can see the dura on the top, the arachnoid on the bottom, and we can see this collection of blood that is under the dura, but also above the arachnoid at the same time. And notice that we don't have blood in the sulci, which is a different physical compartment. So the subdural hematoma tends to be very extensive from front to back and from top to bottom overlying the cerebral hemisphere. What accounts for the attenuation or the density that we see on computed tomography of the blood in the subdural space? Whole blood is about 35 to 45 percent red cells and whole blood is about 35 to 45 Hounsfield units. But when blood stops moving, it forms a clot. And the serum, which is the plasma that has become separated from the red cell mass, is basically mostly water. And the red cell mass, once the red cells are pulled together and separated from the fluid component of blood, will have a much higher attenuation, and they will have a Hounsfield units in the range of 60 to 90. And that's the attenuation or density that we see on the CT scanning. So we expect that the serum is going to be very, very dark, but that the blood is going to be very, very bright or white on the CT scan. So the acute subdural hematoma will be hyperdense or hyperattenuating. If we go from being white to being dark, the hypoattenuating or hypodense chronic subdural hematoma, after degradation of the red cells, in going from white to dark, we must be gray in between. And typically, the isodense subdural hematoma is identified on imaging between three days and two weeks after the onset of trauma. Once again, we have an isodense subdural hematoma. We can see the sulci 
on the patient's left side go all the way out to the inner table of the skull, but on the patient's right side, the sulci stop, and the gap between the end of the sulci, which is the subarachnoid space, and the inner table of the skull is the space that is filled by this epiarachnoid or subdural hematoma. And the green line there indicates the edge of the brain. We can have very, very complex subdural hematomas that have a heterogeneous appearance and a mixture of high attenuation and low attenuation lesions. We can also have repetitive bleeding into the subdural space either as a result of continued bleeding from the original vessels or as bleeding from the neomembranes that form around a subdural hematoma. And again, the subdural hematoma can layer around the hemisphere and can even track underneath the temporal lobe as is illustrated here on the left-hand slide. So the subdural hematoma is really in the epiarachnoid space and can follow around the brain any place where the arachnoid goes. When we have a subdural hematoma in a child, we are always concerned about the possibility of non-accidental trauma or child abuse. Here's a patient that has an acute clinical presentation with a layer of blood. Notice it is smooth where it faces the underlying brain. It does not go into the sulci because it is not in the subarachnoid space. When you consider child abuse, you have to consider that in a child under the age of six to eight months, they may have very poor head control. And in addition to having the subdural hematoma, they may also have whiplash injuries, as in this patient that has a fracture of the C2 cervical vertebral body. And this is likely to occur because in a child, the head may be 15 to 25% of their total body mass. And in a shaking injury, Classically, in the sagittal plane, we have the mass of the head working like a pendulum on the cervical spine and causing the underlying trauma. When you consider child abuse, you want to remember that it is basically like multiple sclerosis in the sense that lesions are separated in space and in time. You must always have an adequate ophthalmoscopic examination when you consider child abuse because retinal hemorrhages are more highly correlated with non-accidental trauma as opposed to ordinary accidental trauma that has a low incidence of having retinal hemorrhages. And we can also consider other imaging that might be tools in identifying that the patient has been abused uh, in the skeletal system and in ribs with special rib fractures related to the posterior ribs articulation with the transverse vertebral bodies. Interhemispheric accumulation of blood is also highly significant in suggesting non-accidental trauma, and the blood accumulates here against the dural membrane, again, not in the subarachnoid space. We can see here on the CT scan that the collections are smooth as they point towards the uh, surface of the medial aspect of the hemisphere. This is very different from subarachnoid hemorrhage subarachnoid hemorrhage is going to have a zigzag appearance as it goes into the sulci. And we can see here the difference between blood around the convexity and in the interhemispheric fissure, smooth towards the brain in the subdural space, as opposed to this appearance here where we have subarachnoid hemorrhage and we can see that the blood is zigzagging into the sulci uh, even though it is in the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere. Trauma is the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage may be difficult to see on CT. A non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage suggests the possibility of a ruptured aneurysm, but may also be seen with vascular malformations, some neoplasms, and also with spinal lesions causing blood in the spinal subarachnoid space. Lumbar puncture is much more sensitive than CT in identifying blood in a subarachnoid space. Lumbar punctures are usually not needed to evaluate the potential for traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. And again, the arachnoid membrane goes all the way around the hemisphere. The space between the brain, pia, and the arachnoid is a subarachnoid space. The space external to the green line is the epiarachnoid or subdural space, and this child has bilateral extraaxial subdural fluid collections. And again, we can see here on these coronal images a very, very nice demarcation between the subarachnoid space, 
the subdural or the epiarachnoid space and the rebleeding into that subdural space that has produced the acute hypo uh, intensity region here overlying the patient's uh, right cerebral hemisphere. The formation of membranes occurs weeks after the creation of a subdural hematoma. These membranes typically develop from the outer or dural margin, not from the inner arachnoid margin. And these membranes will encapsulate the subdural hematoma. And they can create loculations in this subdural space. And the membranes are highly vascular and they are prone to spontaneous bleeding. So that a patient may end up having, as we see here, enhancing membranes, loculated membranes with individual pockets of dependent layering of fresh hemorrhage superimposed on the liquefied blood from previous chronic uh, subdural hematomas. A similar process is illustrated here with re-bleeding into the subdural space and a dependent sedimentation layer. Comparing the epidural and the subdural hematoma, the epidural hematoma typically has an acute presentation because of the associated scalp trauma. The epidural hematoma usually has that nice biconvex shape. And the subdural hematoma is venous bleeding. It may accumulate more slowly. It may be bilateral. A skull fracture is not required. And the patient may have a delayed or uh, subclinical presentation uh, with blood in the subdural space.